Okay, we are recording. Today is Monday, August 3rd, 2020. Um, this is the Keisha Farms Committee meeting, slated to begin at 5.30. Um, based off of a forum, I will have the chair call the meeting to order. Just uh, one last thing. This does in fact comply with the governor's executive order regarding virtual meetings and with that, Madam Chairperson, I turn the meeting over to you and I'll assist in any way I can. Thank you. If you could put the agenda on the screen, that would be great. Let me call the meeting to order and take the roll. Um, Mary, can you see everyone that's here? Awesome. Great. Hang on. I got the wrong agenda. That's a council meeting agenda. No, it wasn't actually. Just to confirm, are you seeing the Keisha Farms agenda? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay, we have a quorum, so we can uh, begin the meeting. Um, did everybody get a copy of the minutes? Yeah. Are there any yep. changes or additions to the minutes that you'd like to make? All right, hearing none, Here. can I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved, Jim. Do we have a second? Second. All right, second. Jenna, um, any abstentions? Okay, all those in favor? Signify aye. 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 All right, thank you. All right, um, open issues, old business. Do we have anything, Gary, that we want to consider under old business? I could give you an update um, that uh, tonight at the council meeting, we are um, we're doing budget transfers, end of year transfers per our charter. So funding that might be in a surplus within departments for whatever the reason may be. Um, there's only so many places where we can reallocate those funds afterwards. Um, they have, it's called, um, most accounts are lapsing funds. So whatever departments request at the beginning of the year, if they don't use those funds, they can all only fall back into non-lapsing funds per charter. In this particular case, I've asked for, um, $55,000 of the surplus that's going back um, to the, the fund balance to be used uh, for a consultant related to Keisha Farms. I have no idea if it'll get approved that way, but that is my request um, to try to go back down this road one more time. So stay tuned for this evening and you know, maybe after all, we'll end up with a consultant. Wonderful. Are, are they aware, Gary, that we had went through the whole vetting process and that we did select a consultant and that, the, okay, so they're aware. Yep. That, okay, good. Good. All right. Well, I hope, I hope it passes and maybe Sue can give us some insight into that. Is there any other old business that anyone wants to bring up? I'll fill you in on Dan Silbo's research uh, later on in the agenda. All right. So new business. Um, I'd, I'd love to welcome and introduce you all to Sue Bettino. Hi. Hi, Sue. Hi, Hi Sue. She, um, could you, I'm going to introduce you as the head of the Newton Community Farm, but you may have a, a more accurate title. And I will just say to the committee that we learned about you through one of the consultants that we just mentioned. Um, oh. They had worked on creating your farm and introducing it to the Newton community some 15 years ago, and they included it in their um, brochure and we're very proud of it. So that's how we learned of you. Then I, I told you earlier that I have family and friends living in Newton who also said it's the centerpiece of um, family life really in Newton. So thank you for joining us. And if you wanna just give us a little introduction about yourself, we would love to hear it. Sure, well, I'm happy to be here. Thank you for reaching out. I'm so excited for all of you. Sounds like you have a great opportunity in front of you. Um, I'm Sue Botino. I'm the executive director of Newton Community Farm. Um, I, I, I'll just start at the beginning, I guess. Um, so my background is in environmental economics and I'm the second executive director of the farm. Um, I did get your questions ahead of time, so I'll use those kind of to guide what I'm gonna tell you now, and then you can ask any questions you have. The farm um, has been around since uh, 2004. The Newton Conservators, which is um, our group, a, a nonprofit group in Newton that uh, helps apply for conservation, um, CPA funds, Conservation Preservation Act funds, 
they came to the city of Newton with the idea of preserving the farmland that was the historic Angino farm and keeping it a farm after um, Mr. Angino passed away. So in 2005, the city um, board of aldermen, which is now the city council, um, they agreed to um, use uh, CPA funds to purchase the land. And in 2006, Newton Community Farm Inc., the nonprofit that I'm the head of now, um, it became the operator of the farm. So we started in 2006. We had a three year license with the city. The city owns the property and all the buildings. We don't pay them rent. They don't pay us anything. Uh, we are required to be self sustaining um, through our operations of producing produce, um, offering educational programs, and preserving the land. So we had a three year lease, then that was extended to another two year lease. And then in 2011, it was extended by 20 years. So right now we have 11 years left on our um, agreement with the city. So when the city set us up, um, they determined that they would have something called a farm commission, which is a group of volunteers selected by the um, city, I don't know if it's the council or the mayor or who, who picks the people that are on these different committees for the city. But anyway, there's a chair of the farm commission and then there are uh, seven members and we meet with them four to six times a year to go over our financials. Um, we have to present them with a business plan every January, February. They approve the plan and sort of keep tabs on us throughout the year. And they're also there to support us and to be a uh, liaison with the city if we have issues that come up, which I'll be happy to tell you about. So you can sort of look ahead to some things you might want to try to prevent from happening. Um, and so they're kind of like the middleman. And then we also work with the city planning department and the um, public buildings commissioner. So there's three parts to our operation. Like I said, our mission is threefold. The first is to grow food. We're a tiny, tiny farm. I'm totally jealous of all the land that you guys have. We would be so grateful for that. We, right now we're two and a half acres of which one and a half acres is farmable because we have uh, um, the way the property slopes and then the farmhouse, the barn, the greenhouse, the hoop houses all take up space. So we figured it's about one and a half acres. So it's a tiny, tiny farm, but we grow about 50,000 pounds of um, vegetables and herbs every year. So we, we are at maximum yield, uh, which is a limiting factor on us for as far as how we can grow. Um, initially, when the farm was set up, it was determined that we would use a CSA model because that seemed like a model that was working well in our in neighboring communities for their farms. And so it gets us um, a, a, a boost of income in the early late winter, early spring. So we originally had 60 shares. So we sold 60 different shares um, and people would sign up for their 20 weeks of produce. Um, we usually start around the second or third week of June with distribution and it goes right into October. So now we have 80 shares, this year 81, slightly because of a, 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 a human error, but <laughs> sometimes we try to squeeze another share or two in there. Um, and those people are either, it's about 125 families that come either weekly or every other week. I, I, I don't want to interrupt if you guys want to say hello to, to Tara. Um, Tara. So, so that's one of the ways we distribute our produce. We, from the beginning, went to the Newton Farmer's Market. There's two markets in Newton, and we do the one that was on the other side of town so that we could give people access on the other side of town. Not that Newton is a very large town. It's about 90,000 people. Um, this year, the markets had to be consolidated and moved to a space closer to where we are. So we're really just going to the market right around the corner. But we think it's important to still give people the opportunity to buy um, produce a la carte. The third way we distribute produce is through our, um, our farm stand, which we built on site a few years after the farm started. Um, this year, the farm stand is closed due to COVID. It's a little tiny shack, and there is really no way to maintain social distancing there. And so we decided to do a different model, which I can tell you about later if you're interested, but it's basically weekly bags of produce that you buy by the week. 
And then the other ways that we use our produce, we sell a little bit wholesale to one fancy restaurant in town. And then we also um, donate about $10,000 worth of produce every year to um, some local food pantries in Newton. So that's the food production side. And that's the financial engine for our operation. When we first started, um, we started doing education programs, just a very small amount of education programs with volunteers coming in, mostly teaching kids, things like that, you know, sweet little one-off programs, classes here and there. And over time that's evolved to become a full-time director of education position. As of two years ago, we hired our first full-time year-round director of education. Um, so that's in addition to the farm manager, that's our second full-time position. And then there's, there's me. So we have three full-time employees. We have, I had to figure this out because it's so confusing with seasonal work. We have one part-time year-round person who works 30 hours a week and he is responsible for all of our computer operations, which is essential, you know, having an online store, registering people for things, troubleshooting, keeping track of inventory for seedling sales, things like that. He runs our events, which right now are zero. And um, what else does he do? He manages our barn rentals, also not happening this year. Um, he's kind of the jack of all trades. So in addition to him, we have a full-time seasonal assistant farm manager, and they work uh, full-time from, oh, I'd say maybe March until, no, until Thanksgiving, assisting the, the farmer. That's a difficult position to fill because it's where you have someone working full-time and then no time for several months. And I know most farms have a hard time filling that position. And then we also have some part-time seasonal workers who help staff the farm stand, oversee any interns that we have, um, things like that. So we have about seven people, plus volunteers, not this year, but sometimes. So, um, and then the third part of our mission is just um, to preserve the historic open space. Our, our um, farmland had been a farm for over 300 years, which Newton is um, rapidly, being built up and developing as a suburb of Boston. And so it's very valuable space. And um, thank you, Cynthia, for saying that it's a, a value to the community. People really treasure the fact that even though it's probably one of the tiniest farms you'll ever find, it does exist. And in general, it's open to the public dawn to dusk seven days a week. And people come all the time and ask gardening questions and farming questions and come to see the chickens. This year, of course, everything's different, but in general, um, those are those are the things that we provide in the way that we do it. I just wanted to ask you, following up, is is the farm profitable? So you know, it's funny because I talked to our farmer about that. So we have a great farmer who's been the farmer ever since our farm started, which I can't tell you how important that is because he has the history of the whole operation in his head, and he's. He learns every year and he's, he's a really great farmer. He is the farm really. Um, the farm, every, almost every year we're able to sock a little bit of money away, maybe $5,000 into savings. And over the past you know, 15 years that's built up. Um, but when you say, is it profitable? It's hard to say. You know, we, we definitely don't run at a deficit, but we could have health insurance for our employees, you know, and that then we, we wouldn't have any extra money at the end of the year, or we could invest more in better technology for our greenhouse, or maybe a new truck or something like that. So, you know, I can say that we are, um, we're sustainable, but as a nonprofit, you know, we run on a shoestring budget and a skeleton crew, just like any non any nonprofit. So, it's a it's a tricky question to answer. Could you tell us about the barn rentals and in the years when those are possible, how that operates, and where the funds go for that? Sure. About five years ago, we did a, a major major renovation on the barn um, in two different phases, and I think one of your questions was where does money come from from things like that. And we've been lucky to have some very generous um, donors in our community who've put forth tremendous um, funds for capital improvements like renovating the barn, renovating the chicken coop, um, what else? Building the farm stand. 
buying the truck, buying the tractor, those kinds of things. So the barn rentals last year, I think we rented the barn about eight times. Um, and primarily that was for parties, private parties, either like an engagement party. We had a, um, a little mini prom for a fraternity. Um, we had a very fancy Halloween birthday party. We also had a meditation class in there. We've had a, a speaker program through um, uh, Christian scientists, I think, rented it. Um, so it, it's buried. I would say um, private rentals are much more profitable. We have two different scales, one for nonprofits renting the space and one for, you know, for-profit or private. So we try to um, give organizations a break if they are nonprofits and, um, you know, then we kind of make a little presentation about the farm and it's a win-win for everybody. So we're working on our rate structure. We were planning to increase it this year, but we, um, we just really shut everything down that was open to the public to limit exposure because we're only seven people and we all work so closely together. It just, uh, we just had to minimize the risk. It's understandable. Um, was the funding of the hoop houses in the barn all done through contributions, local contributions, or did you get any grants? You know, before I started, we didn't have anyone to apply for grants, so we've gotten very few grants. That's not to say we can't get grants, and now I am applying for them, but primarily it was through the founders of the, of the nonprofit, and then, like I said, um, maybe about a dozen um, very generous donors who funded different pieces. There are grants out there. It's a full-time job, you know, to look for them and, and apply for them. Um, and this year in particular, a lot of things that looked promising, now the money is only going to, you know, organizations that are helping people directly with COVID relief, be it food or health or, um, you know, medical. Um, so, so those opportunities kind of went away this year. But we have had some success with grants um, from local organizations. There are a lot, there are a lot of uh, ways to apply for funding if you help to feed the food insecure and if you run programs that help women and children, particularly in the sciences. Um, so that, those have been our angles that we've been pursuing. And then of course, environmental sustainability and being good um, stewards of the land. I took off your website, the Friend of the Farm program for 2019, 2020. Is that where most of your donations come from, that graduated um, contribution ladder that you created? Um, that's where our individual contributions come from. And that ladder system has always been around, but last year we started tying specific benefits to it, you know, kind of modeling it on other large nonprofits. And that seems to help get people to get to the next level or be a little aspirational with, you know, there is no $100 donation, it's $120. There's no 150, it's 170. So we try to like push it a little bit, but the major contributions come through major gifts, which is all through personal connections, relationships built over time. Um, and we're starting a new campaign called For Our Future, which is specifically targeting, you know, could you contribute $5,000 a year for the next five years? Or like trying to get a bigger sum for over a period of time. Those are all my questions. Thank you so much for all that info. I was writing as fast as you were speaking. How about the rest of the, um, the committee? Do you have any questions for Sue? She answered the questions pretty well. Uh, I really appreciate that. So just quickly, could you describe the CSA model that you, uh, you know, who had, what was your process that you went through to get that approved? Or was that just a determination that you guys were able to make internally? So I believe, you know, this is going back 15 years and I wasn't here yet, but I believe that that was all part of the proposal set forth by this, um, initial group of citizens that formed the committee that then formed the farm. And the idea was that, you know, every spring from January through March, we um, send out, you know, a link, it used to be a paper application, but now it's a link to say, um, if you had a CSA share last year, you get first dibs on getting one again. That's round one that's January, then in February is round two. If you haven't had a CSA share, but you live in Newton, you have an option to sign up. 
And then if there are still shares left, then in March it's round three, and that's anybody who wants to get a share can sign up. So we, one of our major missions that we try really hard to abide by is to not have memberships and to not have um, like locked in people. We really wanna make it available to the public. So if you don't get into the CSA one year, you'll get in the next year. You know, we have a wait list. Um, and usually there might be one or two people on the wait list who have to wait a year to get in, but then somebody else rolls off. And like the friend of the farm contributions, we, we can never call them memberships because the one of the whole points of the farm is to not be exclusive in any way. So um, that's something to consider, you know, around the language of when you have your community farm because it's a tricky balance, right? It's community, it's owned by the city, but it's run by a profit, private nonprofit that has to pay its bills, not rent, but all the other bills. And and also some maintenance costs and things like that. So um, we start our CSA then, and then we fill up by March, and then we start distributions in June. They go through October, and then we do a small late fall CSA program, which is up to 40 shares. The farmer will determine in about a month what, what he thinks we're gonna be able to do. Um, and that's late fall root crops. There's four distributions for that in November and December. So we're still picking and cleaning and distributing produce um, right through December. And that's about it. <laughs> then we all pass out for a month and then we start again. <laughs> so one of the things I wanted to tell you guys about that I was saying, you know, is a, a pitfall that you will want to avoid. And that is that the way that we were set up as initially being a three-year license and then a two-year license, some issues weren't really resolved that now that we're going to be around, you know, until 2031, hopefully, um, are, are becoming a problem. So one thing that you'll need to make sure you iron out is the issue of capital maintenance. Um, as a nonprofit, it's written into our agreement with the city that we will be self-sustaining. And we are essentially, you know, we pay for what we need with the profits that we make um, from the farm, the education program, and the, and the donations, and hopefully some grants. Um, but the buildings now are getting older and older and we're having some issues, you know, with parts of a roof leaking. We have a farmhouse that the farm uh, manager lives in. We had a, a major pipe freeze and explode last winter when a door on the barn blew open and it was below freezing, below zero outside, actually. So um, we're having some issues now where it's a gray area. Is that maintenance? Is it is it capital improvement? Who pays for that? And, you know, the city is averse to taking on that responsibility because it's a slippery slope. You know, what, where do you draw the line? What's major and what's routine? Um, again, we are sort of tenants, so we don't want to pay to fix a roof on a building that we don't own. However, it has to be fixed so that the farmer has a place to live because we need the farmer. So, these are the kinds of things that we're now trying to figure out. I think we're gonna be going back to um, the Conservation um, Preservation Committee to see if there's some funding there, because especially this year, um, city funds are really tight. So this is something to think about as you figure out your agreements, who's responsible for maintenance um, and what kind of maintenance exactly, you know, try to spell it out. And, and you said you're a population of about 90,000? Yes not including surrounding area, obviously, that's just yours. Do, do you get a sense, like, do you have a metric or anything that, you know, the majority of people are coming from the core Newton area, or you're pulling people from outside of the area? Yes, and I'm working to get more of a sense of that because we want to do a better job describing what our economic impact is on the area, as far as everything from where we source our supplies, which we try to do locally or in-state or in New England whenever possible, all the way to, you know, who comes to our programs. I would say that right now it's probably about 95% people from Newton who use the farm for programs, which makes sense. I mean, we're the Newton Community Farm. We're owned by the city. Um, that's where we get our most coverage. We're very close to Needham, which is uh, one of the towns next to us. So we do get some people from there. We get a few people, a little bit from the Boston, east side of Boston area where there aren't farms and places to go people looking for, you know, um, some place to go in the summer, send their ki kids to farm camp, that they come to us, we're pretty close. Um, but yeah, mostly it's Newton. And, uh, and, you know, we talked about that 
with the board, you know, is that our goal? What do we want to do? Are we trying to expand our reach um, width-wise or height-wise? Do we want to get more people in Newton to come and know about us? Or are we trying to branch out further into the community? And we decided that for now, our priority is try to get more people in the Newton area involved. The other thing that I'd say to be aware of, which I think you guys already are by calling yourselves Keisha Farm, is that as Newton Community Farm, people often think we're that like I'm a city employee and we work for the city and um, you know they can call the city to rent the barn or something like that. So it's good that you're not um, using the same name as your as your town because that can cause uh, complications and also be a deterrent to donations because people say I already donate I pay my taxes they don't understand that that doesn't pay for the farm we're not part of the city operations so I think you've got that going for you for sure that only pays for my overinflated salary it doesn't go to any benefit <laughs> not mine only yours Gary but not yeah. mine <laughs> could I just ask you to expand on one thing we too have a farmhouse and oh. I heard you say that the farmer or the farm manager lives in the farmhouse on your property. Yes. How does, if you don't mind me getting into the weeds, how does that work out in terms of his salary and benefits and things? Is that one of his benefits? He lives in the home? Sure. So the farm manager and the farmer, that's the same person. A farm manager is just a fancy name for farmer Greg. Um, he, so he moved in right away. Uh, when the farm first started, the city took care of doing uh, major repairs on that house and also stripping all the lead paint, stripping wallpaper. Volunteers came in and painted and cleaned it all up for the farmer and his uh, young family. And in exchange for um, having that residence, it doesn't have anything to do with his job as the farmer. It has to do with his job as he has a second job, you'd say, as the caretaker of the property. So he cuts the grass, um, maintains the property, keeps it looking good, plows the driveway in the winter, um, all that kind of stuff. So he is the caretaker of the property in exchange for the house. So it's completely separate from uh, his farm job. But it's great because when the chickens need to go in or out or, you know, there's ice or something, you know, he's right there. And he also is a great um, set of eyes on the property. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Gary, should we talk about liability? Just because it always worries me. You know, how did you work it out in, in terms of being a nonprofit, having people come onto the property where there's potential for injury or you know, who is liable for the people coming onto the, the farm? Uh, we have a huge stack of insurance paperwork that I myself don't exactly understand but there's a lot that we're required to have. Um, particularly, you'll see like if certain groups wanna come, you'll have to get special riders, like the Girl Scouts always need all kinds of paperwork if they wanna come and do a tour. I, I don't know much about it, except that I know that we are responsible for all of that. We have workers comp, we have uh, everything from volunteers coming to help to people coming for a tour. So I don't know what that relationship is between what we're responsible for and what the city is responsible for. I can find out more from our insurance agent if that, you know, if that's helpful to you. But unfortunately, all I know is that we have a lot of insurance. <laughs> so, sorry. Oh, that's, uh, you know, that these are all things that we're going to be able to want to tell our community too. So thank you for all that. Did you guys evaluate different farming models, uh, the one that you have as compared to like a pick your own opportunity or a combination and, and what was the decision process to decide one direction or the other? Yes, um, the farmer did evaluate that early on and each year he takes a look again. We have some pick your own crops, not this year, We're not allowing anyone to come hang out at the farm, unfortunately. Um, he also has looked at having more of like a grocery store model for the CSA, where you come and take what you want up to a certain value, but it's not necessarily two pounds of cucumbers, one pound of squash, you know, it's more of like a grocery store. Um, and for now, this seems to be the model that um, everybody who's doing it enjoys it. We do a survey every year. We ask what people would like to have di done differently. Uh, we survey the community at large. And 
uh, this is this is just what's worked for us. I don't know if it's the best model. I don't know if we should be considering changing it more. But honestly, you'll see once your farm gets started, you're on such a fast pace that if it's not broken, you just keep going with it. And we haven't heard any um, feedback that people are disappointed. And I think the reason the CSA works so well is because we also have the farmer's market and the farm stand so that however you want to get our produce, it's accessible to you. We also just received our permit to take SNAP and EBT cards. So that's going to help provide more access to people. So we're always trying to increase accessibility and not let anyone feel like the farm is not for them, except that no one can come right now. <laughs> so. Are you guys on a bus route? We're not on a good public transportation route at all, unfortunately. Okay. And then there was a second component to that. I forgot what, oh, any, and I apologize if you said it, I was kind of taking notes and sometimes I missed a few things. Do you partner with any educational facilities in terms of training like local school and agricultural school or even a high school, anything like that to provide um, opportunities or, or did you shy away from that? We've done, we've done some of that. Um, we, let's see, we work with an organization called New Entry, which is through Tufts University. It trains new far young farmers. They get like a little plot and all the training they need to hopefully eventually go out and be the next generation of farmers. Um, we've gone into the schools. We've helped with their um, gardening programs, both public and private schools. We're not large enough to have kids come like a whole grade or a whole class field trip would be really hard for us to have like 30 kids at the farm just because we're so small and our staff is so tiny. But we have groups that come in from say um, the JCC, they'll come in every Tuesday afternoon for a young farmers exploration program or we partner with um, a Waldorf school and they'll come and work on a project every week. Um, that kind of thing. So. Uh, we do, and sometimes we go out into the community. Our our director of education is actually a trained chef, and so she'll go and do cooking demonstrations. And then she has people come in with, um, it's a group of adults with learning disabilities, and she'll cook with them. So we look for opportunities to partner with the community. Um, it's not a huge part of our education programming just because she's only one person and we also have all of our regular, you know, farm babies classes and preparing for summer camp and we have a monthly making pasta for adults program, but we're always looking for ways to expand that so that we can be helping in the community and having people come to the farm. That prompted two questions for me. Do you have a kitchen? Are you using a fully equipped kitchen to, to um, carry on these programs? We do have a kitchen. When they renovated the barn about five years ago, we put in a really nice um, uh, kitchen with a commercial fridge and a double oven, um, a, a dish sanitizer, and a triple, is it? no, it's a double sink and a stove top. And so we do a lot of cooking programs uh, right there in the barn. The one thing I want to tell you too is another local farm, um, Natick Community Farm, they were started out um, in partnership with the schools. And I have to say that I think that that is brilliant because um, you're automatically well known in the community if there's a way to connect with your local school district. Um, they're much larger than we are, so they're able to provide programming for a large group of people. So if you're able to connect with your school district, um, you should do it because then everyone name recognition is uh, a really a commodity that you can't put a price on. It's so valuable. So if you're able to connect through the schools, I highly recommend that. So that's how you'll meet the parents. We are very excited about our farm's location because it is right next to one of our largest elementary schools. Literally, oh, that's great. Walk over to the barn you know, on the property. So it, it just lends itself to so many ideas. I get so excited. One other thing I thought of, our mission is really to determine how the community wants to see this property used. And I heard you mention we do a survey of the community at large. Could you just briefly tell us like how you carry that out? How you, what, what's in it? How do you generate the questions and how it's tabulated? 
Yes. Well, it, I should say it's not a real scientific survey. It's more just, you know, asking people what they'd like to see more of or what they enjoyed about the farm. Um, we have a monthly newsletter that we send out to several thousand people. I shouldn't say the whole town because we don't really have a way to access the whole town, but we are trying to grow our email list as much as possible. We use social media every day. Um, we survey just the education registrants. We survey just the CSA members um, to see, you know, what, they're, what they liked, what they didn't like. We talk to people all the time at the farmer's market. It's amazing. We've been around for 15 years and still people will say, oh, there's a farm in Newton? I didn't know. You know, probably because we're so small, people must think it's Farmer Greg's own residence, I think. But um, yeah, so just in that way, we're constantly talking to people and asking people what they uh, liked, what they didn't like, what they'd like to see more of. We started a, an online cooking show on YouTube, and so we were sending out, you know, recommend topics that you'd like to learn more about. Um, we have a gardening program now because there was a lot of interest at our seedling sale. People said, well, I bought all these seedlings, but now I don't know what to do. I've never grown a garden before. So it's really just talking and listening and constantly asking for feedback. Well, I signed up for your newsletter and I already got the first one. So I was very happy. Oh, good. Hopefully August will be coming out tomorrow or the next day. We'll see. <laughs> See, right. you should reserve some space. She's going to buy a CSA share by the time we're done with this conversation. <laughs> 82 <laughs> members. It's a long drive. It's about two hours. It's fine. I'll ship it to you, you know. Thank I guess that's, so that. If, if I may, just yes. quickly, um, because I've kind of toyed with this a little bit. Um, what do you do with produce or anything grown at the end of the year in terms of, or, you know, do you have a high percentage of, waste? Um, have you partnered with anyone for canning or anything like that? Oh, canning is a great idea. We're thinking of having class on that. Uh, we have very, very little waste, probably because our farmer is uh, hugely anti-waste and he's an amazing um, planner. I'm sure you'll have more waste at the beginning than you will after 15 years. This year, because of COVID, we had to switch out some containers that we used in our big walk-in cooler. We usually use these um, extremely cheap recycled florist crates that uh, a florist gets all her flowers in. Um, they're just open crates. And this year we decided we'll use those for the, to pack the CSA shares. So each share comes up, we hand them their crate, they take their food out and then they leave. They used to be able to go in and, sh and get their stuff, pick it themselves. We don't do that this year. So because we need to use the crates for that, we got new bins for in the cooler that have these, these lids that sort of interlock and fold together. And because of those, we have had so little waste. It's unbelievable. The food stays better longer in those because um, they're sealed up and has to do with the humidity, I think, in the cooler. The ways we do use the extra things, um, let's see. Well, for the Newton Food Pantry, we grow for them. We specifically grow food to give to them. So that's not waste. But the other organization that we donate to, it's called Food to Your Table. Um, there's a there's a volunteer who comes every Sunday and takes what we have left over from the cooler to give to um, those in need in the in the city, and she usually takes everything, and that might be maybe six bins a week, and then once a month we have um, 18 families of senior citizens that we support who live in public housing in Newton, and they take everything that is a mixture of what we grow for them and what we've had uh, left over. And then if we really have stuff left over, we call the Boston Area Gleaners, which is a huge nonprofit, and they come out and actually pick from the field. So we've had them come when we've had like an extra bed of turnips that, you know, everybody's like, we are so sick of turnips. We don't even want to pull them out of the ground. Forget it. They'll come and they pick them, pack them and take them with them. Um, so that only happens every once in a while, but then they distribute through the greater Boston area and they, they're amazing they get rid of like 800,000 pounds of food a year to, to needy organizations. So I would definitely look in your area and see who has that kind of distribution and even picking capability because sometimes you just need someone to help you pick it if it's the end of the season or the end of the round for that particular crop. But I would say the amount we waste is it's really negligible and whatever we have that we can't sell or donate goes to the chickens and they eat it. So we really, I can't, I can't even say it's, 
a garbage can full. It's not even, we don't, we don't waste anything. Good. You mentioned earlier that the, the farmer was already farming the property or did you go through a selection process? It was a selection process. Um, there was the initial um, committee that was trying to set up the farm. And then when the farm got approved and you know, purchased and everything was getting set up through the city, they interviewed candidates and, and they found uh, Farmer Greg. I think he'd been working for a, um, I think he'd been working for either another farm or a, a nursery, greenhouse, something like, something related, but not he hadn't, didn't have his own farm. This is the first farm that he's run um, on his own. And when the city purchased the property, was it, um, did they purchase it with the intent that it would be a community farm or were there other options on the table for its use? There were other options. Um, initially, when the former, the previous farmer passed away, a developer came forward to the city and wanted to buy it and put in a large housing project. And that's what motivated these local residents to get together and, and start a committee around the idea of making a sustainable um, farm and preserving it as open space. And then the Newton conservators came in and said, we think we c you should apply for uh, Conservation Preservation Act funds. We will help you do that. We will be the, the, they hold the easement for the land so that it has to stay open space now in perpetuity. Um, so a lot of neighbors rallied around that because they didn't want a big building on that corner where there'd been a farm forever. And like I said, our area is getting built up so much so quickly that I think when these um, neighbors saw an opportunity to save a space, they all got together and worked very hard and convinced the city that uh, that was the way to go. Well, if there's no more questions, let me thank you on behalf of the entire group. This was so informative and surpassed anything, you know, that I ever even imagined in terms of all the questions that you answered and the um, enthusiasm I think you generated amongst, I know me, I'm probably smiling too much, but mm -hmm. um, about amongst the committee. And uh, if you don't mind, we, we'd love to be able to reach out again. You know what if we have future questions and maybe try and contact the Natick community farm too as well so we're just at the very beginning of this journey and it's nice to see what an incredible success you've made out of two and a half acres it really is thank you so much i really enjoyed speaking with all of you i'm excited for you feel free to contact me anytime with questions if you're in the area i'll show you around i wish you the best of luck and just stay in touch okay all right. Field trip sounds good. Thank you very much. Sue. All right. Thank you. Good Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Bye. Bye. Mary, did you get all that? <laughs> I <laughs> tried to. It's <laughs> recorded. It's that's why I recorded. I don't really have to. It's recorded. <laughs> I, I apologize for being late. I was listening to uh, Dr. Fauci and Ned Lamont. Oh, okay. I'm I'm a co I'm a COVID tracer, so I was asked by the health department to watch it. You know, so I apologize, and then I couldn't get in. Did you hear that, any of it at all, Pam? Well, I didn't want to ask questions like, "Does she ever have?" I, I read so much on the Parm Lee Farm because it was a while ago when I read about this Newton one, and um, I was wondering how big a space it was, which was the last thing that she had said at the end, the size of it, um, two and a half acres or whatever. I mean, do they have artisan markets and, and um, yeah, they do. And also, do they have places for like summer concerts on the land or that's not big enough? Oh, I don't think so. It's a, I mean, no. a year and a half dedicated to farming and the other acre is the buildings and the hoop yeah, and the barn. And, but I mean, just to see what they did in such a small area and realize we have no such kidding. a large area with options, so many other options, so. So would we ever consider, am I allowed to just ask this question? Are we allowed to ever consider having someone live in that house and manage the barn or the property that we? Gary, I don't know. All things are on the table and off the table at the same time, right? So this is part of the scoping process. Uh, Pam, I, you may not have been on the line. I, I am going to council tonight. There's at the I end of the year. No. Yeah. Yeah. At the at the end of the year, we 
we take a look at which departments have a surplus and which ones have a deficit and then we tighten those up and they only can that funding can only go in so many different areas so i've asked the council to reconsider um funding the um consultant to bring us through a plan so tonight we'll see if what happens they may still say no um, yeah but you know the reality is a lot of things have to take place to determine how we use that property including yeah um, to yeah. Cindy's point, insurances and who's responsible for what. And, yeah. Uh, but I think everything is kind of on the table for discussion. Yeah. I'll listen in. Thank you. Sure. Any other comments or thoughts as, after hearing it? Hi. I think so. I, um, I think so. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I just wanted I, to say um, that. <laughs> Tag, <laughs> you're it. You're it. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I just wanted to say that this uh, the nonprofit farmer is a great option, but then also having a farmer that would lease it himself and run a, a farm on his own is another possibility, especially if you have a farmhouse and a barn and and we actually have some farm equipment that wouldn't have to be purchased properly uh, that's available. Um, so that's a possibility, and I hope that uh, Kip Kolosinskis is on the agenda somewhere here. Um, but anyway, go ahead, Tara. Um, I was really sorry I was late to the call. I'm, I'm in a, a house re, a reconstruction here. I've got kitchen people here. It's been crazy. Um, but I was really impressed with the presentation and the notes that I saw prior for only two and a half acres. You yeah. know, the first thing that came to my mind is if we could get this off the ground and this is something that we could do. I, I thought of right away partnering with people like Max Restaurant Group, who does Rosedale Farms and, you know, getting like, you know, being able to introduce our community to people that we could possibly now fundraise from and get other dollars to would be amazing. Um, as she was talking about it, I was like, wow, this could, this could really be something incredible on that property. Really? Yeah. All the way around. What, what they're doing is incredible. And she was very inclusive. Jeff, I love that. I thought of you right away, Jenna. Yeah. <laughs> the director of education was a trained chef. I was like, all right, I know who, who can do that. I mean, <laughs> but did you notice so, how inclusive she was for the community? She really drew from all over the place to make the majority of people happy. There was a little something for everybody. I got the feeling. You know, not just a farm, you know, I mean, I know. Mm -hmm. I thought it was encouraging, you know, that she was able to do so much on the two and a half acres. And, you know, she was jealous of the size of our, Yeah, we, got um, a we can do so much. And, you know, I, I know, I, cause I read there the 2019 uh, business plan that was on their website. Um, that's a limiting factor for them for their growth now is, you know, what do they do because they don't have land to expand into as far as, you know, growing additional crops, but it, I feel like it could be a very long time before we get to that point. You know what I mean? If, if we can slowly grow and, you know, we have that plan, if, if we're choosing to go that route, then, you know, they lasted 50 was it 15 years on two and a half acres? You know, this could be such a long-term thing with the acreage that we have. One of the things that I was able to witness or was a, and a presentation at the uh, state capitol at a farm bureau, I forget what the exact organization, a whole bunch of farm organizations, and a young woman who had started a farm down in, in uh, Old Lyme, I think, and talking about the small intensively farmed business that is profitable today. She had moved from Vermont, originally from Michigan, then to Vermont, and chose this place in Connecticut because it was near customers. And that that small farm could be profitable. Um, and then you have the agricultural grants from the state and the federal uh, ag board to make that, to help that happen. And so, whether it's a nonprofit or whatever, uh, hopefully those ag grants are available uh, for re, you know, uh, regenerating the soil or, or uh, 
right. building the hoop house or whatever, and that we should really look into that. Uh, it's great to have a nonprofit, then that might be the way to go, but you got to have that farmer. That was the, that was the, one of the main points that she made was that it was all based around the farmer. And there are farmers out there who, who are looking for places to farm. Gary, what if we can't get approval for a consultant? What happens next? Well, the reality is we probably at this point need to put ourselves on hold until we find out whether or not we get a consultant to continue to take us through the visioning process. If not, then that's probably when we start going down the process of um, what are the next uses. Um, uh, you know, I don't have really a good answer for that other than us, you know, uh, we can talk to Kip and we can start to formulate our own plan internally and go through that. Um, you know, we, we probably still won't have the same reach as if a consultant did it because it comes down to volunteers and me um, to start to pull people together, but we would do a very similar process, just not as detailed. Um, yeah as a consultant would be able to do it, right? They wouldn't be able to, I won't be able to pull the same market information that they possibly could um, to put it together. So it would still be those same little baby steps, but we would have to do it on our own. Uh, Gary, will that decision be made tonight? I'm hoping, I got my fingers crossed. Yeah. So one way or another tonight, I'm hoping we'll know yay or nay. Yeah. Um, and if they say no, we'll, we'll regroup and come up with next steps. Can you share with them, Gary, the, the fact that we have held a meeting with somebody who's, who at one point was in a similar situation and, you know, the visioning process is critical for us to go forward because that was the key element of our committee really is to try and get public input as to how people want to see the land used. Yep. Yeah. If the, if the opportunity comes up tonight before them, um, it is an individual line item specific. So they may direct questions to me. So. I'm sorry, I'm getting like the lines from the sun coming through on my face. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we will, uh, I will have that conversation with them and try to try to explain to them. But many of them have kind of heard my rant. So I wanna be careful obviously not to beat a dead horse and say the same thing over and over again or accidentally say the wrong thing. Um, but yeah, I would, I would explain to them. I mean, I've, as I said at the last meeting, I've, I've had some experience myself in this direction, so. Um, you can look at examples across the state and across New England where similar models have worked. Frankly, with all of that acreage, my opinion is there's something for everyone here. So it's a matter of what it looks like and how you carve it up appropriately to benefit the community as a whole. And that's one thing that I'm going to continue to press um, on. And how you fund it once you decide what to do. That's another factor. I, I don't know if Parmalee Farm is on the, this part of the agenda, but I did talk with a woman who, the volunteer who kind of makes that all happen this afternoon. This is a farm in, preserved by Killingworth, probably, I think, 15 years ago. And they had a, a, a big visioning thing and, and so forth, but they had no funding. So that went nowhere. And then they started volunteers developing the thing. They don't have a farm. They have community gardens and they have an out, uh, pavilion space for outdoor events, which during COVID-19 turned out to be the best thing ever. ever. Um, and so that's going very well for them. And that's, that's one of the places they raise funds. Um, and I guess they charge people to, for their community gardens, but um, they also that's have, there's 132 acres too, fairly large. So they have trails through the woods and so forth, and it backs up to other uh, land trust areas as well. Mm -hmm. But they yeah. do a lot of the same things that Sue just talked about, which that's what I was comparing when she was speaking. Yes, that's true. You know, I don't know about a sugar house, but scout projects, trial, trail system, artisan markets, community gardens, educational programs, you know, um, concerts, summer concerts, shared garden, gardens, public and private events to rent, which I thought of the income, you know. I know, Gary, you're somewhat time constrained. And I, if I could speak to Dan Silbo, 
um, he was able to find out the contact for the Boy Scouts that had worked in Mill Woods and doing the trails and things. And if and when we're ready, he's willing to reach out and, and make that connection for us, whether it's a cleanup, you know, we, you know, again, of course, there's liability and concerns with COVID and things that would never be done unless it was appropriate. But we have made, he has made that contact. So we, we will be able to reach out to them if and when we can do some kind of service project there. Do you think there'd be any volunteers in town, you know, people like who do tree servicing and, you know, who chop up the dead stuff and, you know, for the betterment of the town? I don't know. I'm pretty I, sure I, I would run, I'd run into a problem with that one, with staff, would. probably. I mean, I, it doesn't hurt for me to ask, but my assumption is I will. Huh. I'm never afraid to ask. It's, I just wouldn't be surprised when they say, uh, we have a guy that does that and you're taking work away. And it's a huh. fair point that they make. But the guys we would be getting would be for free. So that, <laughs> that would be the argument. Like I said, I have, I have no issue. I've got, you know, I don't want to paint a bad picture. I, I've got a great team of employees who who uh, you know, like those community projects for many reasons. Um, so I don't know if they would stand in the way, but I also want to be considerate of the fact that this is what they do. Mm. And that's not a bad thing because then they'll be invested in it too. I mean, mm -hmm. it, it really will be a community farm with, the, mm -hmm. with all kinds of elements of the community participating. Mm -hmm. All right, what do we have left on the agenda? I can't see it anymore. Back up. We have. Well, I was afraid when I do this, I put up the wrong screen. Can you guys see the agenda? Okay. Is. Um, is there any other business to come before the committee? To, uh, could I just, uh, we were going to get together and walk the park property with Kip Kolosinskis, and that didn't happen. I wonder why. And Gary, you seem as though that's not really on the agenda. Maybe we can do it now that it's cooling off a little bit later in August. Is that a possibility that we could reach out to him and see if he would like to? I mean, Gary, we need you to you know, say that it's okay that we're on the property, but. For us to walk the property? With Kip, for, Kip for this group. With Kip Kolosinskis. Pick a date. All right, I'll call him up and we'll make a date. Okay, good. I would, I would say this though, let's also wait to see what the council does tonight. That would- Sure, I will call them tonight. A, so we can coordinate appropriately. Sounds good. All right, what does the September meeting look like? Does Monday fall on Labor Day or is that the Monday before? Say that again, which? Which um, I'm trying to, th I don't have a cat. Yeah, it does, it does. It would be, oh, like, just looking at the calendar, it does. Okay, so what would be our next, the uh, next available Monday date in September? Is it possible to move to Tuesday that week or no? I, think I have council, so it doesn't matter to me. I mean, it'd be the same. Oh, I could do it Tuesday. I could do Tuesday. Yeah, me too. That's Tuesday the 9th, right? It's the 9th? It's the 8th. 8th. Tuesday the 8th. All right, so Tuesday, September 8th at 5.30. And then Gary, if you get any good news tonight, please email us. That would be, a, that would be wonderful news. Even if we do it by Zoom or have to do some kind of, you know, Hi, Mike. How are you? Hi, Mike. Did you take care of everything? Everything was good. Everything was good. Everything's good. Nothing's on fire. No, no, no. She's a little, she's a little nervous, but everything's okay. All right. Good. Good. All right. Well, I'm sorry you missed um, what turned out to be an incredible informational meeting. One of those ones that get you excited about the possibilities. And yep. Gary is going to go before the <clears throat> council tonight, and perhaps get some information about funding for the consultant and the- That's great. Process. Right. Um.
Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank we you. To, we need a motion to adjourn if, if that's the way we're going. Okay. Can we get a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. All right. That was second. A second by Mike. And yep. uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.